On my far left is uh, Gene Daddle, who is the author of a very powerful new book called Reckoning with Race, America's Failure. Gene grew up in the Mississippi Delta and has really been surrounded by African-American poverty his whole life and perplexed by it, I think, is a good way to talk about his, his powerful writing. Uh, Anthony Bradley from King's College is a distinguished uh, uh, faculty member there and the uh, author of uh, uh, the director of the Center for the Study of Human Flourishing, chair of the Religious and Theological Studies program, and the author of the book Black and Tired, Liberating Black Theology. And uh, uh, Susan Gooden is a pr professor at uh, the L. Douglas Wilder School of Government and Public Affairs at Virginia Commonwealth University. She's also the president of the American Society for Public Administration. And Susan has completed a, a, a fascinating new study which she'll be uh, reporting about and falls directly into the context of what we're discussing here this morning. I want to begin with Gene, and I, I didn't bring up your book to uh, disrespect the author's, the other author's books, but, but rather to quote from it, if I might. And we were talking at the end of the previous panel about programs and <coughs> efforts, concentrated, uh, government-directed programs, and uh, whether they helped or hindered, and there was some uh, skepticism about them. There's a lot of skepticism in your book. Uh, trillions of dollars were spent, I'm quoting now, but the results of the massive programs were elusive at best and did not end poverty. Uh, and then you quote an official in the Office of Economic Opportunity who wrote, who wrote uh, I can't think of a single idea or policy recommendation that emanated from the group that was of any lasting consequence. Well, that's, that's very dispiriting. Uh, what do you take away from that experience? We still hear calls for a Marshall Plan, for a major government intervention to uplift the black poor. Uh, what do you take away from the experience that began in the 60s and persists to this day? What lessons should we learn? metaphor in terms of uh, black leadership. Now it's also the favorite metaphor for a lot of other things. Um, but one of the things that I take away from it is the large programs, once you deal with the federal government, it has to go down to, to the local uh, community. The local community administrates it. So um, you end up with the same problems, which are the bureaucracy, the inefficiency, <clears throat> and the lack uh, of accountability in terms of these, these, these programs. They all fit the same model. There are a lot of small programs uh, that work. Everybody has, has a, a favorite one. I think that the, the 60s, in terms of the hope uh, that occurred once le overt legal segregation uh, was removed, I think was a bit of an illusion. Remember, um, in, uh, in 1964, a few days after Civil Rights 64 pa uh, passed, which was public accommodation, you had race riots uh, in, in major cities, New York, Philadelphia, Rochester, and also uh, towns in New Jersey. Six, after Civil Rights 65, uh, you had Watts occur. So there were, there were a lot more issues and complexities. The, the framework for dealing with overt legal segregation would become very, very different than what we have today. And uh, the problem surfaced immediately uh, in, in the 1960s. Um, that's a start of that. I also think that... that give, give, the, give, us, give us some specific... Is, is it the, the lack of accountability in the bureaucracy? Could something work if it were structured in a different way? Is there anything that you look back on and say, yeah, that helped? And, and we should learn from some, that. Certainly some people, some people were helped, and as the previous panel indicated, uh, whether it was uh, Pittsburgh or any other place, that there were some people who, who, who trickled through this. But I think we're always going to come back to the building blocks of society. And this, this predates education, which are the family, the, the community, and the religious organization. And they're seriously afraid within the black community. What what um, I concentrate on in the book, and I think everybody in here would agree with me, is how to move a mass of black America into the economic mainstream. 
you know, we have several categories of black. This is not just black America, one monolith. Uh, there is a black elite that's excelled in every aspect uh, of American life. And white America has, in, from the, even the early 19th century, has always recognized that white psyche had room for uh, a black elite. Then we have a middle class. The, the, one of the problems with the middle class is that it has a very fragile asset base. And I'd like to talk uh, a lot later about the private sector, because there needs to be a movement, um, major movement, in terms of the private sector before the poverty, the underclass that we know, as well as the the income and, and uh, asset gap of the middle class. OK, so those are some things we want to leave on the table, especially uh, the private sector, which I think understands itself to have been under tremendous pressure all these years. So I'll be interested in how you want to expand on that. Let me turn to uh, uh, Dr. Gooden. And uh, uh, this will be, I think, a little bit of a breath of fresh air, uh, considering the context that we've been uh, 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 involved in so far this morning. Uh, Susan has been looking at three admittedly small programs that harken back to some of the values that uh, Jason Riley was talking about earlier in the early 20th century. Uh, and uh, uh, I would love for you, Susan, to tell us about those programs. Full disclosure, one of them is represented here and is going to be on display at the end of this uh, uh, program this morning. Uh, Tell us about those programs, what you found they were accomplishing, and how you uh, see their effectiveness. What do you trace it to? Well, thank you, Howard. And first, I'd like to thank the Manhattan Institute. And uh, it is a privilege to be part of this panel this morning. I just want to make one slight correction in your introduction. Howard mentioned that I'm the president of the American Society for Public Administration. I'm actually the immediate past president. So just in case I get run out on a rail, I want to make sure that Janice Lachance, the current president, doesn't get the hate mail. So I want to make sure it comes directly to me. Um, but now just a little bit about the programs. And as Howard mentioned, um, these were three very fascinating programs. And there were two parts to this study. Uh, so we looked at three nonprofit organizations that are led by African Americans. One is the Mama Foundation for the Arts, which is in Harlem, not too far from here. The other is the New Jersey Orators, um, and Eloise, the executive director, is here now. And the third is the Reclaim a Youth, uh, which is outside of Chicago, Illinois, in Glenwood. Now, each of these programs had three different areas of focus. So for the um, Mama Foundation, it was on the preservation of gospel music and vocal talent. Uh, for the New Jersey Orators, it was on oral speaking skills and performance. And for Reclaim of Youth, it was more on general college preparation and life skills. Um, and so we did in year one, which was last, uh, it was summer of 2015, spring of 2015, we went out to um, all, the, all the high schools, the senior high schools in that area, and we surveyed three groups of students. We surveyed those that had participated in one of the African-American-led programs. We surveyed students that had not been in any of those programs. And then we surveyed students that had been in some sort of after-school program, but not one of the three. And we looked at four dimensions. We looked at academic performance, deviant behavior. We looked at family and social support. Uh, and we looked at self-esteem and resiliency. And so the findings of this, when we compared across these three groups, and it was over 700 in, uh, students concluded in total, we found that the first takeaway was that being involved with something after school or extracurricular was certainly better than nothing at all. Um, and so we think that there are two things going on there. One is the positive impact of doing the after school program, whether it's basketball or one of the African American led programs, uh, and also the protection against perhaps doing more negative things during that time. But what we also found was that the African American led programs outperformed the other programs, and these were a wide array of programs, on a number of issues as well, particularly in terms of overall academic performance, and this was grades and also in terms of just self-esteem and resiliency. So self-confidence, uh, confidence in their ability, uh, resiliency and ability to sort of navigate conflict, they outperformed the other two groups. So then fast forward, this past spring, uh, the summer of 2017, so the students had graduated, and we did a follow-up or a year two study. 
And really the question was, where are they now? So you think of the Oprah Winfrey, you know, where are they now? Let's see where they are now. So we did follow-up phone interviews with all the students had um, participated in the African-American-led programs, as many as we could get, and we got about 79% of them all together. And we found that um, close to 88% of them are attending college, or have attended college in the past year. Many of them are doing it in combination with work. Um, so that compares with an attendance rate of about 40% overall, 35 to 40% all nationally among African American students, so certainly much higher. We also found that about three quarters of them, or 72%, rated their experience with African American led, their African American led organizations as very effective and they cited that as very effective in being able to navigate life. Two things that I, uh, that we think we associate with that. One is I think the promotion of old school values and I think we've already had some discussion of that I, I as gotta well. I've got to slow you down. You can't just drop that phrase <laughs> and not explain it. Yes. Old okay. school values. We got a panel here called Culture and Family. What the heck is old school values? So old school values is a term that really references um, respect for others, um, respect for elders in the community, uh, respect for self. It also represents being able to pull out the best in someone, that the best in someone is not predetermined by an SAT score or their grade point average to date, but the idea that with it, as long as there is a desire to learn and a desire to do well, that with the appropriate amount of support, this student can excel. Um, and so I think the closest term, um, but it's not exactly that term, is tough love. But I don't think that it still doesn't quite capture it. Because there's a, a, a sense of compassion, but there's also a sense of um, expectations and responsibility that go along with that. So and it sounds like what you're saying is that despite the hand-wringing, or notwithstanding the hand-wringing about culture and family, that there is some residue of this upward mobility culture that we were he hearing about as having been vanquished somehow by government. Absolutely, and I would say it's larger than residue. I mean, I think that you will find this, and I think this is one of the things. I think, first of all, I think we saw throughout the programs um, that mentors in the program and leaders in the program are able to impart to youth an ability to excel while being black from someone who has experienced, had that experience firsthand. And I think that that is a very powerful thing that these programs are able to do. And I think the students who are receiving this information are getting it from very trusted sources. Um, and I think that that is also one of the features or one of the factors that, that makes it successful. Excel while being black, that's a very powerful phrase. Yes, so, you know, essentially, and I think this gets back to uh, some of the points in the earlier panel, um, there have been successful African Americans and it remains successful African Americans. I think what happens is that the narrative is dominated by those who are not as successful, by those who are struggling. Um, and I think part of it is that success in the African American community largely becomes invisible. And I think one of the things that each of these three programs does is it increases the visibility of African American success and they're able to convey that to the youth that are being served. Visible for the students themselves. Yes, and I should mention that the students, the pro the students served by the programs are not all African American. They're certainly open to students of all races, uh, but they are African American led and predominantly they serve African American youth. Right, and just to be clear, are these government supported in some way? They are not government supported programs um, directly. Uh, so some of them may have informal ties to school systems and that sort of thing. But these are grassroots organizations. I mean, they are nonprofit organizations. Largely, oftentimes, they are being um, supported by volunteers in the community. Um, but people who know the individuals um, and very much respect the individuals who are leading the programs and leading the training. Um, and so just to sort of finish and answer the where are they now, in addition to them evaluating their programs as being effective, uh, we're seeing that large numbers, again, close to 88% are enrolled in college. Now, the, the not so great news is the amount of student debt that these students are reporting. And of course, we know that this is an issue um, that's a national issue. Uh, about uh, over 52% had already taken out student loans uh, exceeding $5,000. 
and 17.4% had taken out loans just in their first year between twenty dollars and $29,000. And that links back to what Gene Dattel was saying about the fragile nature of the African-American mm -hmm. middle class and its uh, limited asset base, one, one could say. But let me turn to, to Dr. Bradley. And uh, 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 Susan Gooden talked about three programs, the New Jersey Orators, Gospel for Teens, Reclaim a Youth, and at least two of those have links to the African-American church. I know New Jersey Order started in a, in a church basement. Uh, the Mama Foundation up in Harlem, they put on great shows. I recommend that you go hear them. Uh, uh, Gospel for Teens uh, is clearly putting forward uh, a religious tradition mm -hmm. explicitly. And I suspect that uh, the, the, the members of uh, Reclaim a Youth may know each other from church. That wouldn't surprise me. Dr. Bradley, we, we have always heard about the black church as the, the vanguard of self-improvement, upward mobility, community cohesion. Is it still that today? Absolutely. And again, uh, thank you for having me. I'm, I'm uh, delighted and honored to be on the panel. The, 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 the black church historically has always provided people with two things, mainly. Uh, one is hope. Uh, but in the midst of lives that are challenging and, and uh, uh, seemingly insurmountable, you can do it, right? And so there's just a lot of hope. There's a, a lot of, of, of encouragement. And secondly is, is a community uh, where there is that accountability uh, and uh, expectation. And when you have hope and accountability, you, you often have success. The other, the other contribution the black church has made historically is, is the, the cultivation of the soft skills that make people successful in the marketplace. Right? Soft skills in church? You got to help me here. Absolutely. So uh, issues like respect, uh, respecting your elders, respecting your employers, saying please, saying thank you, uh, dressing well. I mean, uh, I was born and raised in, in the black church. And so when, when you were a child, you see older men and you say, well, I need to be like them. Uh, they, they're successful. I need to do what they do. I need to dress like they do. I need to talk like they do. I need to, I need to model myself after them. And so you, you, you have those sort of soft skills uh, that are the you know, real engine of, of progress within the marketplace. The, the other challenge, though, is there has to be some market opportunity, mm -hmm. right? And so when you, when you look at the reason there were riots in Watts, the reason there were riots in Detroit is that the economic opportunities have started to decline. By the time we got to the mid to late 1960s, you had this great migration up to the north and the jobs are starting to already disappear, right? And so, and so with the great soft skills, with these great programs, the family and the church, you also have to have real economic opportunity where people can uh, uh, begin to, to see that they can make a difference in their community in terms of employment, that they can make things that, 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 that the market needs. Uh, we also, I think, sometimes forget that the basis of family is employment and jobs. I'll, I'll give you a, a great example. In the church I'm currently serving in, in, in Harlem right now, uh, we have a lot of ex-offenders. And this is what happens. When they come out, when they get a job, then they get married. Then they want to take care of, of their children. Then they actually want to plug in uh, uh, to the community because now they have employment. They're, they're, they're a part of the marketplace. They are a part of, of the uh, community. So we have to have both of these things, right? You have to have the soft skills development, but we, you also have to have uh, economic and real market opportunities that often are, are undermined by all sorts of good, intended, well intended programs that, that remove the low skill labor market from the proximity where people need the jobs the most. Well, tell me a little bit more about that. Well, there's this, this term called spatial mismatch, right? Uh, I, I first learned about this from. Uh, William Julius Wilson in the, in the book, uh, When Work Disappears, back in 1996, where you have the, the people that, that, that are, are low skilled, they, they, but they live very far from the places that have those low skilled uh, job opportunities, right? So there's a, there's a mismatch spatially. And I see this on the subway. If, if you take the subway in, in, in the, the morning here, there's a big difference between who's on at 5 a.m. and who's on at 9 a.m. 5 a.m., it's mostly black and, and, and Hispanic men. At, at 9 a.m., it's middle class people like me. And what's happening? You have, you, have, you have these black men from the Bronx and Queens coming way out into the city for low-skill labor uh, uh, sorts of jobs. The professionals come in 
uh, uh, later. So, so th there's, this, there's this, this mismatch where, where the people that need the opportunities don't live at, uh, near where, where those entry points are. So if, if you look at neighborhoods in Atlanta, in Detroit, Philadelphia, D.C., uh, where you have low-skill labor, where you have economic depression, there aren't a lot of job opportunities. I thought maybe you were going to talk about minimum wage, too. Well, we, we, yeah, uh, well yeah, I mean, we could, um, <laughs> but there's not even jobs that allow them to have a minimum wage job. I mean, I was, if, if you go up... Well, I was going to play it the other way. Has, has the minimum wage removed the jobs from their immediate neighborhood? Well, I mean, you have, you have the minimum wage, you have OSHA regulations, uh, you have all sorts of, of barriers to entry in terms of small businesses. Uh, I, a, 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 a few years ago, I wrote this piece called Let, Let the Hustlers Hustle. And if you go <laughs> into any black community, in, in any community of color anywhere in the world, you're going to find people who are naturally entrepreneurial. And the question is, why, why is it that that natural entrepreneurial spirit isn't given a place to cultivate and grow. And, and we're not talking about criminal behavior. We're talking Absolutely about- Absolutely not. Right. Right. They, they, they see market opportunity and they want, and they want to meet those, those uh, real needs. So there are lots of issues that actually undermine those economic opportunities for people. And that has to happen also with the context of virtue and, and, and moral and character formation uh, as well. Right. So we have an interesting issue on the table here uh, implicitly, which is, does, do culture and family soft skills are they necessary to get jobs, or is there something wrong with the economic marketplace which is not serving uh, the poor? And Gene, you were the first one to raise the private sector as somehow problematic. Why don't you expand on that now? Yeah, okay, <clears throat> let's start uh, with, with the private sector. And one of the things, studies that's very interesting now, and we're talking about a different segment of the population. Uh, we're talking about a black college students and what they major in. Georgetown study, 40% of the college majors of black uh, students uh, are um, essentially community act activist or uh, social work, uh, very low paying jobs. Uh, the, the next category in terms of finance or engineering or, or STEM or computer work is all clustered around five to seven percent. So these are college graduates all of a sudden baking in an income, uh, an income gap. So you move down the scale in terms of, of where the pipeline is from high school to college. Uh, almost 50, 60 percent of black students uh, need remedial work. When you talk about um, specialized skills, for example, the United Negro College Fund uh, and the ACT testing uh, testing program essentially had, a, had four different categories, reading, English, uh, math, and science. Uh, and they said, okay, who were, what category of black person was ready in three of those uh, four categories? And there were only 10%. Uh, Hispanics was 24%, and you get the um, uh, white population as 50%. So you're moving down, uh, down, the, down the line in terms of we know what the, what the capabilities of, uh, in terms of the New York City school systems are in terms of math skills uh, by the th third to eighth grade. And again, back into, uh, back into the family. What does the family mean? In terms of simplistic terms, it's, we're talking about an extra income, we're talking about love, attention, and discipline. And what we're, trying, we're doing now is dumping those kids who, with the, the statistic being between 65 and 70 percent of all black children under 18 are raised in single parent uh, homes. You're dumping those kids into the school system with these small programs and they're trying to supplement uh, what, what is missing in the family. So the tough love part actually should be, should be started much, much earlier. Let, let me just jump in, Gene, and say, okay, so there, you're making two points. One is, again, returning to the family and the need for, for preparation. But let's go to that major college majors point, right? So when people say private sector, I suspect they think you're going to go somewhere as follows. There needs to be more hiring. Silicon Valley doesn't represent enough African Americans. The media, as we heard from the uh, question before, doesn't do enough, a good enough job uh, reaching out to the African American community. You're saying something else. Absolutely. You're saying that the job skills that are available in the market, marketplace are not being chosen by African Americans. Now we have two African American college professors here, so let's test Ooh, that. Can I make one, one more point? No, I'm going right to see <laughs> uh, uh, This is tough love, man. <laughs> 
Well, first of all, I mean, and I think this goes back to the point um, you, you asked about earlier about what does it mean to excel while being black. And I think part of it is realizing that uh, and understanding that racism and structural racism is part of the reality in America. And I think, you know, uh, there are lots of evidence to suggest that. And so that's, that's part of the status quo. So when we look at majors, part of that is backs back to opportunity. Um, so if you look at, um, for example, the offering of AP courses. So students who get into the most selective universities and are able to major in um, STEM fields and, and, and the like, oftentimes have taken AP courses um, as part of that, as, as part of them making them attractive to um, university X or Y. But if we look at that, um, the offering of AP courses, uh, there are disproportionately fewer of them that are offered in majority minority schools, particularly majority African American schools. And so when we look at that opportunity piece, and so I think that's why we have to think about what is the role of individual responsibility, but then what is the role of structural opportunity um, that is afforded through the public sector um, and even through the private sector. I mean, one of my uh, favorite programs that I like to watch from time to time is this program called Undercover Boss. It comes on M MSNBC. And I think one of the things that happens there is that at the end of the show, I don't know how many people have seen it, but at the end of the show, um, the CEO has established some sort of rapport oftentimes with the frontline worker and says, you know, I'm going to give you $15,000 for college education of your, your child or to buy a home or whatever. So there's this recognition implicit in that that there's some sort of recognition that just doing this job that you're able to do and that you're showing up for and that you're doing day in and day out is not going to in and of itself get you to where you need to be. Otherwise, there wouldn't be this allocation of resources. But what's happened is that empathy has taken place as part of that. And I think one of the things that's really missing in American society today is that we have lost that ability to empathize. And I think it came up on the um, preceding panel when Mark made the, the, the um, talked about, you know, on the, on the cable news network, it's cheaper to have people talking at each other rather than having people going out to communities and learning about each other. And I think once we can restore empathy, um, I think that goes a long way to fostering wanting to have the best for humankind. So again, we see in your, in your uh, thoughtful remarks the intertwining of preparation for the marketplace with a sense of opportunity denied by the powers that be, if you will. What do you see at King's College here in New York? Do you, do you see that choice uh, of majors or sure. prospects in life as being the reflection of opportunity denied or uh, bad choices? Right. Uh, it's, it's actually, in, in my experience as a professor, uh, neither of, of those things. It has more to do with, with exposure. Here's, here's what I mean. I was just having this conversation with an African-American student last night after a, a, I, I gave an exam about her career. She's a senior. What course was this? Uh, this was a course called Christianity and Society. It's a, a course on Christian social thought uh, in, in, uh, in uh, the West. And we were simply talking about her future. And what I was doing for her was giving her suggestions and, and expanding her imagination for what she could do. Her imagination was law school, right? And I said, well, what about this and this and this and this and this and this and this? And she had never, I mean, I mean the, sort of those sorts of opportunities. What were some of the this and that? Um, start a business. Uh -huh. Right. Be a job creator. Uh -huh. um, why don't you go and, and, and not simply work for a nonprofit? Start your own. Right. Be entrepreneurial. She has fantastic gifts. This is the great contribution of the black church. And this, to me, is the elephant in the room, is that the black middle class left. And when the black middle class left urban America, they 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 took with them the moral and and vocational imagination for what you could do. Right. So, for example, in the black church, you've always had black doctors and lawyers and engineers and scientists and things like that. But what happened when when uh, the, 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 the black middle class left sort of black flight that we don't talk too much about uh, when all the professionals left to move to the suburbs, which wasn't a bad thing, by the way. I mean, I was I was uh, the, the beneficiary of that when my parents when my own parents moved from the inner city of Atlanta out into the suburbs of, of, of 
Atlanta. They took all of their professional values, those, those uh, soft skills, those uh, uh, virtues with them, and what was left in inner city Atlanta were people for whom their frame of reference was limited. So, so in the black church, you had this. You had kids who would grow up and see a black doctor, lawyer, engineer, et cetera, and say, but one day I could do that. Right? And, they, and they had an entire community who would then invest in this child to make sure that he or she could, could, could get there. A lot of that's been lost. And so what, we, what we've done, we've, then de, we've then, we're now relied on uh, 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 some government institutions to try to pr provide a surrogate context for those sorts of things. Right. right? We've, we've, we've created a lot of nonprofits to create a surrogate opportunity uh, for um, uh, some of those things. But that's, that's what the, the black church has always done is, is, is provided that. And I, I had a fantastic uh, opportunity to uh, mentor this man who was absolutely headed to prison. And what did I do? I took him sort of under my wing. I, I took him to my family's house in Atlanta. We drove around Atlanta. We saw, the, I was like, hey, African-Americans live here. And his eyes popped out of his head. And just him seeing something different just changed his imagination. He didn't need a program. Uh, he didn't need uh, a grant. Uh, he didn't need any of those. He just needed to see something different. And it changed his whole vision of how he wanted to live as a black man. And those are the sorts of, of opportunities we, need to, we, we also need to, to, to infuse more imagination right? Programming alone, I, in, in my opinion, doesn't, doesn't do that. It, it, it really takes that personal one-on-one -on -one, uh, 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 contact to, to infuse a sense of, of you know, I, I believe in you and here are some of your options, and then to push people in some of those directions. Well, Susan, you talked about excelling while being black and saw it linked to what I suppose are programs, but there's a lot of personal mm -hmm elements in the, in the programs that you, you studied. If, if we did think there was a spark in the kinds of programs that you studied, and it seems to be there is because the results look pretty good, the obvious rejoinder is, well, they're just tiny. They're helping a few hundred kids. We should be actually depressed about that because they're so small. Uh, how should we think, and I want to have all the panelists think about this, if we're talking about changing norms, which is the hardest thing to change, right? Much easier to cut a check. Hard to change norms. Uh, how do we get it? There's always this talk about getting it to scale. How, should we worry about that? How do you think about it? How does everybody think about it? Well, I think, first of all, sometimes I think we have to avoid setting up sort of false dichotomies. I think it is, I, I completely agree that it is oftentimes when we look and we ask individuals who have been successful, uh, perhaps coming out of very difficult environments, they will sometimes mention a teacher, a program, a family member, someone who has invested in them. And I think that can come from, it can come from a relative, it can come from a program, it can come from a school system, wherever it comes from, I think it's great and we need to have more of it. And I don't think we want to close off one avenue and say it only can come from the family or it can only come from the government or it can only come from a nonprofit organization. We want it to come from all of these and we want it to be mutually reinforced um, because there's certainly um, sufficient work to be done um, in, in that regard. In terms of replication and scaling out, I've always been a bit skeptical of that. I know that's something that has, it's always, okay, this program works, now how do we take it to scale? How do we replicate it? Um, because I think oftentimes these are built on relationships, and a lot of those relationships are community and contextually based. I know we spent a lot thinking uh, time to, uh, on this panel talking about um, urban African Americans. Um, my background happens to be, uh, I, I grew up in a very rural area, in a rural community. Where was it? Um, in uh, Bassett, Virginia. Wow. So uh, a very small area outside of Martinsville, Virginia, which is outside of Roanoke, Virginia. You still haven't heard of any of those as close as to Greensboro, and, North and Carolina. And check out so. Susan's grandfather's CD of rural blues from Virginia. Very That's powerful. Right. That's right. Yeah, Country blues roots revive. So I think that looking at, um, you know, sort of thinking about these are only urban issues. So it, Again, I don't know that a model that works in an urban community is necessarily going to work in a rural community. And so I don't think that we should be on this chase for a miracle silver bullet. Uh -huh. I think we should be looking for and, and trying to see what is going to work in this context and how do we get more of that um, success rather than trying to say let's find a one-size-fits-all. 
Right, and that gets me to, to Gene. And in your book, you have a, a, a wonderful, uh, I almost want to call it a parable of Mount Bayou, Mississippi, right, which was the effort in a very small rural place 100 years ago to create a self-reliant black economy in, in rural Mississippi. Uh, that didn't work out too well, but you, you found something, you found a mixed message in it that you, I, I think, feel applies today. Yeah, in terms of Mount Bio, it was probably the, the most important um, all-black community in America uh, and had major support from Frederick Douglass, Booker T. Washington, Theodore Roosevelt, and Julius uh, Rosenwald, who was not mentioned among the uh, philanthropists today, but is, was very, very key. Um, it, it was a, a black community about 20 miles from where I grew up, and I've done studies there. I've had kids do uh, fellowship programs, uh, research programs there, et cetera. It was started as, as a, a cotton community, and uh, it thrived for a little while. But the, we always get back to economics. The roller coaster economic world of cotton um, uh, basically destroyed it because there's no way to have a, a self-contained, self-sufficient uh, ethnic uh, economy within within the mainstream. It has to be integrated. We have to get back in terms of, of when the integration, when the assimilation is, is um, uh, is possible. In terms of Mount Bio, it was crushed in terms of uh, the cotton economy. Uh, when cotton prices went down, uh, there, was no, there was no infrastructure around it uh, to compete, so there, to, to, to support it. So uh, Mount Bio becomes, for me, uh, the, the example of the impossibility of, the, of a self-sufficient uh, economic, uh, economic community. One, one of the but there's that beautiful picture of the stepping stones. Oh, that, that, I should have uh, brought it. So there was, when we're talking about scale, it turns out Mount Bayou can't scale. You can't have Mississippi become a, you know, a black economy state. But you found a kernel in there that maybe can be scaled. And, and I'll get back to that issue when I talk to Dr. Bradley. Yeah, and this is getting back to the previous uh, panel in terms of uh, do you have to start with an integrated school system at the beginning? And, and I agree. The, the real uh, core question is uh, where does the skill set come from? Where does the knowledge uh, come from? Where does the ambition come from? And it's at a certain point, at a certain point, the black student has to ha be ex exposed to a white student, and the white student has to be exposed to the black student. The ideal place for this, obviously, uh, is the university. There's no residential segregation involved. There's no busing involved. And I think that uh, what concerns me in terms of, of uh, of where we are today is the separatism uh, on campus, uh, the ability to interact one-on-one, -on -one, person to person, disagreement, discussion um, ab about core topics that, that even aren't race related, uh, could be economics, could be uh, historical aspects, et cetera. I think that's gone. We're using institutional crutches now uh, in terms of, of circumventing the, the frank discussion. It could be the government. It could be uh, a group identity. It could be um, uh, a, uh, an interventionist organization uh, that gets involved. We need to have more one-on-one -on -one discussions uh, in terms of those people. And university is the proper place. Even when you move into a corporation, this funnel in terms of um, the, the black um, the black race role uh, is very destructive in terms of even at a, at a corporation to be put in the d diversity section. You need to be discussing what what is important with in terms of making that corporation or your business successful as opposed to the ancillary uh, issues. I think we're a little bit behind that. When we talk about racism, I think we should basically uh, start defining what it could be. It could be a slur. It could be discrimination. It could be violence. And it could be exclusion. We can't use the term racism uh, as an umbrella topic anymore. Right. So let me just push back a little bit on Dr. Bradley. Uh, it was kind of a, a friendly disagreement here, right, where Susan is saying, well, you, you can't just look to one-on-one -on -one because that isn't going to do it. And then we get to this issue of how you change norms. Is one-on-one, is, is -on -one, if everybody did something and took the ex-offender on the tour of, uh, of what part of Atlanta was it? Uh, Southwest Atlanta, yeah. kind of Cascade uh, area. Yeah. Right, mm -hmm. and said, whoa, this is really great. Yeah. But that doesn't sound scalable. Right. So how, how do you think about this changing of norms toward ambition 
toward the kind of things sure. that you're doing with your student that you were Yeah, I mean, it, it actually is scalable. It just doesn't need to be in a program, right? Uh -huh. We don't need to programize it. We also do not, don't need to federalize it. Uh, I mean, what, what happened to the idea of actually caring about your neighbor? Uh, and, and actually wanting your neighbor to thrive and flourish and, and succeed. So maybe what, we need to, what needs to be scaled is us actually caring about other people other than ourselves. Maybe that's actually the core problem. And maybe there's just too much narcissism and too much individualism and too much consumerism and too much materialism. Maybe, maybe those are the reasons we don't really care about our neighbors anymore. Uh, what, what we need, I, I, would, I would argue, are, are more local solutions, right? We need people right. who know their own issues in their own communities, right. who, who build partnerships with people who have solutions to those, to those uh, issues, and to let local communities do that on their own terms and leave them alone. Uh, they, they don't need someone to parachute in from D.C., or in some cases, they may not, they may not even need someone to parachute in from their state house. Uh, to sort of direct the program, but to let local people uh, uh, lead local solutions, because that's the context where people are actually known, uh, where, where, where real needs are uh, actually met, and, and they're met effectively, and they're met effectively in the long run, because the best information about that area is being met by the people who know the area the best. Uh, part of our problem, I, I would uh, argue, uh, is that we, we actually don't encourage uh, sort of local imagination for local solutions. And so we need more small programs. So now that's a really fascinating kind of summa remark, I think, because the disappointment that we began this discussion with about the federal programs, the green shoots of hope that Susan uh, brought to our attention, now we circle back and you're telling us that the federal programs may actually have suffocated the local imagination, to use your term, but in terms of caring for our neighbors, I guess you really do teach Western Christian thought. Eh? Yes, right. Yeah, 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 right. I mean, there's, there's a lot of competition, and, and, and we, want, we want local communities to be empowered to take, care, to, to, to take ownership of the issues and the problems of their own communities and not, and not simply be dependent on a, a, a federal solution matrix. Well, we're going to have an inspiring story, I know, from uh, Dr. Ben Carson, our keynote today, but we've got a few minutes for Q&A. And uh, shoot. Uh, yes, a young woman right in the middle there. Wait for the microphone. Tell us who you are and tell us who you want to direct your question to. Um, hi, my name is Rachel Atkins. I'm a graduate student here in uh, the city. Um, I guess whoever would like to take the question is fine. Um, as I'm listening, one of the things that keeps ringing in my ear is something that I think my prof one of my professors would probably um, want to maybe rebut I guess for lack of a better word, and um, uh, in a lot of his work, he looks at um, comparing sort of black and white families or individuals who have the same level of education, who have the same family structure, et cetera, et cetera. So a lot of these variables that you've been um, talking about and still seeing large disparities in outcomes and particularly in wealth to um, Mr. Daddle's point about the fragility of uh, assets in the black middle class. So I guess my question then to you is, if, if not structural issues, then what? When we've already accounted for people who have you know, two families, uh, two parents at home, and have you know, college-educated ed parents, or they themselves are college-educated, and we're still seeing these huge um, uh, multiples um, of differences between their outcomes in terms of especially wealth. Yeah. Huge is, is a very key phrase there. Gene, is that? It's Does the data game. back that up? That is, if, if you uh, uh, work hard and live by the rules, if you will, as Bill Clinton once put it, you're still likely to have a big gap there. I think it's a great question. And I think that um, one of the things in the black community that I've, I've noticed, uh, this is historically based, is the de-emphasis in, in terms of the, the private sector. So these, these categories that I mentioned, there were higher paying jobs. Are, are, are not looked at um, carefully within the black community. And, and there's a real dichotomy here. I think Frederick Douglass and Booker T. Washington understood this in terms of, of what I call the occupational shift um, that has not occurred within the black community. Part of it is this, it's not a demonization, but uh, it's, it's a clear lack of interest. And I don't think it has anything to do with institutional racism. 
All right, well, that's a, a, a very powerful uh, reply, and I suspect your professor would want to take strong issue with that, but uh, mm -hmm. uh, so be it. Uh, okay, other questions? Uh, yes, in the back, the gentleman, yeah, you, you wait for the microphone, tell us who you are. Uh, Jesse Russell, and uh, I'm actually from Nashville, Tennessee. Uh, many of you probably refer to this as segregation, uh, but I tend to refer to it as educational redlining that I went through during my formative years uh, in Tennessee. And what I mean by that is that as you grew through the educational system, I found it interesting that the previous panel did not address the competitiveness of America based on the need for the transformation of our educational system. And that what I experienced during that time, and I'll get to the question in a minute, what I experienced during that time was the redlining, uh, educational redlining that was taking place was that we were trained to go after getting a job by going, to, uh, going through high school, going to college and getting a job versus going through high school, college and creating a job. Uh -huh. And that it, uh, I didn't understand that because I wanted to be a researcher, technology and research, but in Nashville, Tennessee, nobody really did that. The research center was located up in New Jersey which was called Bell Laboratories, which I learned about through pro college professors from Stanford, but I couldn't get to New Jersey because I was living in Tennessee. And, and the educational system was directing me to manufacturing and things like that that was in Tennessee. So I, I just, the question that I would raise is this educational transformation with the cultural uh, impact that this panel is talking about. I wonder if you guys would respond to how do we deal with American competitiveness given the educational system, the way the culture is set up here? Uh, it's something needs to change, right? And uh, otherwise we will continue to lose the strong, uh, what I would call a technological edge that we've had in the United States to compete. Well, that, that, that circles us back to uh, Gene's point about college majors. And we have, again, two university faculty members. Th this is a... a uh, uh, conventional wisdom that we're falling behind, we're not competitive, and our institutions of higher learning are not doing enough. From within academia, how do you see that, Susan? So I think one of the main issues is that as a society, we're satisfied with leaving too much untapped talent on the table. Uh -huh. And I think that's a fundamental problem that we see structurally from day one. Um, so there's a young man, a, um, a cousin of my husband's that uh, we became his legal guardians about three years ago. Um, he grew up in, a, in one of the worst housing project, projects in the city of Richmond. Um, and so, you know, now he's in our home. He's still in public schools, but in a much better public school system. What is going to be his story five or six years from now, hopefully when he goes off to college and is successful? I don't know that he's going to come back and say, oh, it was because Cousin Susan, Cousin Basil took me into their home. Maybe that was the factor. Or will he say, it was because I went to a school system in which I was supported and I just got the Science Student of the Month Award last month. I mean, it's going to be difficult to disentangle. Um, and, I, nor, and I don't think it's necessarily helpful to disentangle. Was it a different public sector intervention? intervention? Was it a different home environment? What were all the, how did all of these things um, uh, make an impact? But what I think happens is that regardless of how it happened, we have untapped talent or talent that may have otherwise gone right. unrecognized that now hopefully is on a path to which um, he is going to be able to become um, a, a very uh, successful young man, not just for his own, him own, his own self, but also for society at large. And I think when we think when we start thinking about that, whether we're looking at private schools, public schools, homes, I think we just all as humans have to say, we want to maximize the talent that is before us and the youth that's before us, and how can we best do that? And if we all get on board with doing that, then I think churches will do their part, schools will do their part, leaders will do their part, business and industry will do their part in terms of hiring practices, and we can get there. But we don't need to, to say, well, it needs to be this and not that. I think we need to say, how can we, there's so much work to do, why would we want to close off any potential avenue to it's get us there? It's interesting. There's kind of an unspoken implication uh, uh, to the question, which is a great question, that we need something grand. The problem is so big, we need the big grand solution. 
And it gets me back to Dr. Bradley, who said, well, actually, no, we need local imagination. Are you willing to resist the grand solution? I am, in part because I haven't seen a grand solution uh, work out too well uh, <laughs> in the long term. This is a fantastic question. Uh, we have a lot of untapped talent that I often gets herded into things that typically underperform in the marketplace. Uh-huh. Right? That's Gene's point, too. Yeah. So, for example, I walk around the city and I'll, I'll, I'll meet a teenager and say, hey, what, what do you, you, you want to go to college? Yeah, 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 I want to go. What do you want to major in? Criminal justice. <laughs> Why? Why, do you, why would you want to major in that? There's so many other things, so many wonderful things that you could major in, in the liberal arts, right? Why don't you major in literature? Majoring is something that, that, that unlocks your imagination for the needs of the marketplace and then go meet that. Why don't you major in something beyond uh, what you've heard? But it takes someone actually giving them a larger menu. This is why you know, some, some of the magnet high schools are terrible places. They, they kind of herd you know, minority kids in, into the arts and music and performing, right? As if it's like 1940 and that's what we do. We perform for people, right? And so we have these magnet schools where they, where they dance and sing, um, but, but we don't have very robust liberal arts education that expose students to the sorts of things that, that, uh, that sort of allowed the people in this room to succeed and flourish in the marketplace, right? So, we, so we, we, we have to give people more options and more exposure so their minds are actually, are actually uh, 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 stirred up to, to want to do things beyond what, what they've seen in their immediate context. And that, and that takes the sorts of relationships that you talked about, uh, 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 new friendships are gonna take some programming, uh, but those things are going to be local. But I, again, I'm going to go back to this. Actually, going to take people like us who have the success and the resources to personally put ourselves in front of people and and give them uh, that imagination. And in some ways, you've summed it all up: the untapped potential that we're reaching for, culture, family, the right majors, the right aspirations, love and empathy, a lot of constructive responses to a very difficult problem. Please join me in thanking our panel.